Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Basord. I'm a consultant doctor and psychiatrist, and I work in private practice in Harley Street. And I'm delighted to be joined for this podcast by Professor Edward Bullmore. And we're going to be talking about his new book called The Inflamed Mind, uh, which is a Sunday Times bestseller. And the subtitle of the book is A Radical New Approach to Depression. So Professor Edward Bullmore trained in medicine at the University of Oxford and then at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. After working as a physician at the University of Hong Kong, he trained as a psychiatrist at St. George's Hospital, the Bethlehem Royal, and the Waterloo Hospital in London, and as a clinical scientist at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London. Since 1999, he's been a professor of psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, where he's now head of the Department of Psychiatry and director of the Wolfson Brain Imaging Centre in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences. He's an honorary consultant psychiatrist and director of research and development for Cambridge and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. Since 2005, he's also worked half-time for GlaxoSmithKline and is currently leading an academic industrial consortium for the development of new anti-inflammatory drugs for depression. He's a world expert in neuroscience and mental health. So welcome, uh, Ed. Um, your book starts with the point, which is shocking, and, and many people don't realize this, that in terms of comparing psychiatry with the rest of medicine, we're lagging way behind in terms of developments for new therapeutic treatments. Um, the, the drugs that we're using today to treat depression are more or less exactly the same as the drugs we were using back in the 1990s. And the rest of medicines moved on rather dramatically. And your book seems to be uh, partly a response to this problem that that many people don't realize exists. Yes. So uh, thanks, Raj. It's, it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you about the book. And thanks for inviting me on to do that. Uh, you're right. I mean, I think I often think if we, uh, if I was to carry on practicing psychiatry now based only on the content of the textbooks that I studied to get membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists back in the early 1990s, I don't think I'd go far wrong. Um, if I was to do the same as an oncologist or a neurologist, if I was to you know, treat cancer based only what was known to cancer physicians in the early 1990s, I think I'd be struck off. Because in uh, many other areas of medicine, we actually put cancer medicine somewhere near the vanguard of medical progress overall. Uh, the last uh, 30 years or so have seen quite dramatic improvements in terms of understanding and treatment of uh, disease. And uh, time has stood still a little bit in uh, psychiatry, I think. You know, and that's uh, not because there hasn't been um, important research advances. I mean, I think if uh, you, you look, for example, at the neuroscience of psychiatry, which is one aspect of thinking about mental health, um, you know, there's a huge number of papers and a huge uh, amount of information we now have about uh, the neuroscience of psychiatry that we didn't know in the 1990s, but it hasn't uh, made much difference to uh, practice. You know, life goes on in uh, NHS uh, outpatient clinics and, and uh, inpatient units, uh, as far as I can see, pretty much the same way uh, as it did 30 years ago. And I think that is a, um, you know, I think that's a challenge for us all. I think we have to think, well, why is that? Uh, does it matter? Um, and, you know, uh, what are we going to do about it if we if we believe that it does matter, as I do? So your book could be seen as a kind of searing critique of the kind of model that psychiatrists seem addicted to. Uh, and, and you're kind of saying that model is flogging a dead horse. It doesn't work. And that model has something to do with a neurotransmission hypothesis that will prescribe drugs that uh, target neurotransmission, the gap between nerve cells, what happens there. And that's the location of where the problem is. And your argument is, no, we've been barking up the wrong tree. Yeah, I mean, I think my... Um, my most sort of fundamental criticism of, of how we've gone about developing drugs uh, in particular over the last 20 or 30 years, it, it's not so much that we've um, assumed that it's uh, all to do with neurotransmitters. I think it, more fundamentally, we've, we've tended to assume that, uh, you know, a syndrome like depression uh, is all one thing, that everybody who's depressed uh, is depressed for the same reason, the same causal factors, and therefore, uh, if we could only find it, uh, everybody with depression should respond equally well to uh, a, some miraculous panacea, some antidepressant drug that would work uh, 
very well for everybody with depression. Um, and, you know, in the book, I call that the sort of one size fits all assumption. Um, I think it's been very prevalent in how we think about uh, mental health disorders. It's certainly been very prevalent in how clinical trials for uh, mental health disorders, depression and psychosis, for example, have been designed and conducted in the past. Um, but again, if you look at other areas of medicine, um, it, that's not how uh, um, progress has been made. I mean, you know, uh, breast cancer, for example, you could think of as a clinical syndrome. But the the people that are driving therapeutic progress in breast cancer aren't assuming that everybody develops a, a tumor in their breast for the same reason. There could be different genetic risks. There could be different pathogenic pathways that get you to the same clinical syndrome. And increasingly, uh, in other areas of medicine, you know, biomarkers and uh, other tests are being developed to identify, you know, in a patient, let's say with a tumor in the breast, what uh, are the particular risks? What are the genetic factors? What is the cause, uh, if we can identify it, that causes those um, problems for that particular patient? And then that has implications for treatment. So a lot of the new uh, cancer medicines are not one size fits all. They will be um, designed and, and validated to treat patients that have a clinical diagnosis and some biomarker evidence that they're particularly likely to respond to the new drug. That is... You know that's the stra- that's the, to me a very rational, uh, science-based way of thinking about uh, treatments. That there's a sort of clinical syndrome that we can recognise when uh, we talk to patients or examine patients in the clinic, and then under, underneath that there will be uh, some kind of biological explanation, some causal explanation for where the syndrome comes from, and we should be target- targeting the causes rather than targeting the symptoms that make up. The clinical syndrome. That is, I think, where things have been moving in, in the rest of medicine for some time. And I think one of the reasons that we've seen you know, relative stagnation of therapeutic progress in, in relation to mental health is because I think certainly for drug development, uh, a lot of the, the thinking has been uh, anchored to this sort of rather uh, outdated idea, I would say, that one size fits all, that you know, we can find an antidepressant drug or a psychological treatment or whatever it might be that is going to work uh, perfectly for everybody with that diagnosis. I think that's just not realistic. And, and actually, if you look at you know, the data on where we are, you know, there was a meta-analysis published at the beginning of last year from Oxford looking at all the uh, antidepressant um, trials uh, so far published and many that hadn't been previously published, just looking overall uh, those data. There's clear evidence that we have in our hands antidepressant drugs that are moderately effective. Um, I don't. I don't want my book or this interview to be misinterpreted as saying as, as saying that all the treatments we have are useless and should be immediately discarded. Because uh, the, there is clear evidence that it, the antidepressant drugs we have access to work moderately well on average. But there are two other things that that meta analysis shows. One is that. Uh, it's not the case that the newer antidepressants are more effective than the older antidepressants. There's no evidence of therapeutic progress in terms of efficacy if you look at those data. And of course, a moderate effect on average um, doesn't mean that everybody's going to get some moderate degree of improvement. It suggests that there will be some people that get uh, a terrific benefit from uh, existing antidepressant drugs, and there'll be many people who don't. And we know that you know there's at least a third of uh, patients who have uh, to suffer persistent depressive symptoms despite being offered treatment with existing antidepressant drugs or psychological interventions. There's a, there's a lot of so-called treatment-resistant depression out there. And uh, I think we need to focus on what can we do? How can we change the way we think about depression? And how can we change the way we find new antidepressant interventions that might be a little bit more personalized, a bit more targeted, uh, perhaps particularly on those people that are not seeing uh, a, a terrific outcome based on treatment with the options already available to us. So the book is not just a, a very clear um, description for the lay reader of the neuroscience and the current neuroscience thinking behind 
um, things like depression, but it, it's also a fascinating historical account. So let's go back to the beginning of antidepressant treatment, which is, oddly enough, anti-tuberculosis treatment mm. uh, back in a, in a hospital um, in America, um, in New York, I think it was, back in the 1950s. So they find this new drug, aproniazid, I think is how you might just uh, pronounce it. And um, the, the patients are dancing in the aisles of the wards mm. and, they, and everyone assumes it's just because they're euphoric because their tb is getting better mm. but you're coming up with an alternative alternative explanation can you take up the tb story yeah well i mean this is a fantastic you know it is an extraordinary story and it's uh, a great example of accidental discovery of serendipitous discovery um and as you say in the 1950s um tuberculosis was feared um, and stigmatized um, because it was very often uh, chronically progressive and fatal, and it it wasn't very well understood or couldn't be very well treated. The city of New York uh, built a huge sanatorium called Seaview Hospital. They put it out on Staten Island, um, ostensibly so patients would have the benefit of you know um, sea breezes um, to help their recovery, but it was also to some extent, an effort to quarantine uh, patients with tuberculosis, separate them from the rest of, of the city. And I, as far as one can gather, it was a pretty dismal place, um, uh, a little bit like Hotel California in a sort of morbid way. People could check out, check in, but not very often leave um, the hosp- hospital because there was no effective treatment. And then... Uh, the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, began to develop uh, antibiotics that would work for tuberculosis. And Ipronizid was one of the, the first to go into a clinical trial at Seaview. And, you know, it had these extraordinary effects on uh, people's mood. Um, uh, patients who had been, you know, lying on their beds um, um, for some time, uh, fatigued, exhausted by the disease, uh, was suddenly up and about uh, dancing with the nurses. Life magazine sent a, a team out to Seaview Hospital and, and they ran a famous piece which was headlined Dancing in the Wards. And, um, it, you know, that was a very interesting uh, and unexpected uh, uh, effect of the treatment. Um, and there were a few psychiatrists in New York at the time. Uh, Nathan Klein was one of them, who became aware of this. And they thought, well, that's very interesting. I I wonder why um, that is. You know, maybe there's something uh, about the drug that has an antidepressant effect. As you say, there was uh, people were quick to say, well, this is just a placebo response or it's just a sort of secondary reaction to recovery from tuberculosis. But there were some people who also thought, well, maybe it's actually a direct pharmacological effect of the treatment. Maybe... um, Ipronizid is a psychic energizer. That was the phrase that people used. And then they looked into, well, what does this drug actually do? And how can we imagine that it might have an effect on mood? And, you know, again, at the time, 1950s, 60s, uh, a very hot area of neuroscience was um, the discovery of dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, serotonin, you know, the, so the, the neurotransmitters, particularly the monoaminergic neurotransmitters, were just bubbling up scientifically. So it was very natural to think, well, maybe this drug, Ipronizid, does something to these neurotransmitters. And it turned out that it did, that it uh, effectively enhanced the availability of um, uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline, particularly uh, if you looked at its uh, at how the drug worked in the lab, it had these kind of adrenaline-boosting effects. And, uh, was, you know, they, the, the preliminary trials were done um, looking at the effects of ipronazid in uh, patients who did not have tuberculosis but had uh, a number of different mental health disorders. Looking back, you know, those trials were uh, quite um, inadequate, to be honest, compared to what we would now expect to see in terms of proof that these drugs really worked. Uh, small numbers of patients, um, not, not always very well uh, uh, characterized before they were offered uh, treatment with the new drugs. But the, the first trials looked promising enough for uh, uh, various pharmaceutical companies to 
uh, start marketing ipronazid and, and related drugs as a new uh, type of treatment for depression. And this is, at the time, at least by some people, was was heralded as the golden age of psychopharmacology. You know, suddenly uh, we had, uh, it seemed, uh, access to these wonderful new drugs that uh, could make people less depressed. Um, and we even seem to have an explanation for how they worked, um, that they 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 were boosting these new neurotransmitters that we'd only recently discovered were being boosted in the brain. Um, and that in turn led to uh, uh, a theory about where depression came from. And that is where I think the story takes a little bit of a sort of uh, sort of night's move in a way, because up until that point, it's a, it's a, you can tell the story as a fairly straightforward example of, you know, accidental discovery leading on to trials and uh, the marketing of drugs that, that offer benefit to many patients. But the question of how they worked um, was more problematic because it seemed reasonable uh, to many people to say, well, look, you know, if all of these drugs that we now know are antidepressants, if they all boost adrenaline, noradrenaline, serotonin, uh, when we look at them in the lab, maybe it, we should uh, imagine that um, the, the reason the patients were depressed in the first place was because there was some kind of deficiency or imbalance of neurotransmitter metabolism in their brains. You know, maybe to put it very simply, um, People get depressed because there's not enough serotonin in the brain. It's a serotonin deficiency that causes depression. And they come to us as psychiatrists. We offer them treatment with a serotonin-boosting drug uh, like Prozac. Um, that restores the biochemical balance in the brain. <clears throat> and that's why they get better. Um, but I have to say that you look back now and there still isn't very good evidence for uh, the second piece, the, the, the disease theory of depression in terms of uh, monoaminergic deficiency, reduced levels of serotonin or noradrenaline, we still don't have very good evidence that that is the case. Um, so I think where we've ended up is uh, with some drugs that work and that are valuable. And I'm, I've, I've said already, I'm not trying to uh, uh, you know, uh, recommend that we should abandon the use of existing drugs but we, we don't have a very good understanding of how they work. Um, and as I point out in the uh, book, in, 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 in the form of an anecdote based on my early experience back at the Maudsley, we still have very limited tools, in fact, no clinical tools worth talking about that we can use to measure the level of serotonin or any of these other transmitters in, in the brain of an individual patient we don't. We can't diagnose the quote-unquote serotonin deficiency uh, that has been theoretically uh, proposed uh, over many years, and we we don't have any very good way of predicting which patients are most likely to respond uh, to these uh, drugs as opposed to alternative types of treatment. So uh, it's a curious story of discovery, and it start. I think the root cause of the uh, the issues that we now have with uh, serotonin modulating uh, and, and monoaminergic depressants is that, you know, we we in a way the story starts um, the wrong way around. It starts with an accidental discovery that a drug works or has a, a potentially beneficial effect, rather than starting with a deep understanding of what causes the symptoms, at least in some people in the first place. Um, and that, of course, is the way that ipronizid was originally developed to treat tuberculosis. It was, it was, it was shown, it was understood that tuberculosis was caused by uh, the tuberculosis bacterium. This drug was identified to kill the bacterium, to kill the, the cause, and then it was shown to have a clinical benefit in uh, trials. And that's really the logical way we should go about uh, discovering new treatments is to start with the cause and follow through until we find an effective treatment. Whereas in the in the case of uh, uh, monoaminergic antidepressants, we started the other way around. We started with some clinical trial evidence of a benefit, and then kind of reverse engineered uh, a theory about how that worked and where depression came from in the first place.
So another way of thinking about that flaw, as you put it uh, in the book, is the lack of a biomarker. You're, mm. you're, you argue in the book, we need a biomarker that is the signal that you've got the disease. And then we use that uh, to underpin our understanding of the disorder and then, then move on to treatment. So you do talk about some biomarker candidates, um, cytokines, C-reactive protein. Tell us a bit about these inflammatory biomarkers that I think you're arguing in the book are, are where we should be looking and why, what's the link between these biomarkers, the inflammatory theory and, and depression? Okay, well, so let, let me start with the, the relationship between inflammation and depression. And, um, I would venture to say that it's common knowledge that inflammation and depression often go together. Um, I mean, I've certainly had myself experiences of, you know, brief inflammatory episodes that have been associated with mood blips, with brief depressive episodes. Uh, in the book, I talk about my uh, experiences with dental surgery. Um, but I think another experience that a lot of people might have had is vaccination. You go, you go to a, a travel clinic to get vac vaccinated against typhoid, um, for example, you'll be injected with um, an attenuated form of the, the typhoid uh, bacterium, which elicits an immune reaction. It's designed to do that. It makes you slightly inflamed. And uh, very often, uh, for a day or so after that, you'll feel a bit off color, you know, uh, a little bit subdued, perhaps less energy than normal, a little bit gloomier or more socially withdrawn. It's quite a common experience that inflammation, um, uh, often triggered by infection and some kind of psychological reaction to that, uh, whether it's depressive or, uh, fatigue is, is quite a common experience. Another very common example of it. If you've got, if you look at patients who have major inflammatory disorders, you know, uh, like for example arthritis, um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, um, if you look at the rates of depression uh, and other psychological symptoms in those uh, those patients, they're much much higher than the background rates you, you'd expect in in people that didn't have. Uh, uh, you know, arthritis, psoriasis, or whatever it is. So we know that uh, medical inflammatory uh, disorders are associated with a, with a higher risk of uh, depression. The question is, therefore, in my mind, not are inflammation and depression associated with each other, because I think that's beyond reasonable doubt, actually. The question is, what explains that association? And the, the new idea in the book, which is uh, sort of uh, a distillation of a scientific program that's been unrolling over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so, particularly, I would say, is that the, the relationship uh, is could be causal, you know, so that inflammation of the body can directly cause changes in how nerve cells work, how the brain works, which uh, ultimately cause the changes in, in mood uh, and other behaviours that we recognise clinically as a, as a depressive syndrome. Um, so that causal uh, hypothesis is very important to the whole story. Um, and in the book, I lay out some of the evidence, and perhaps you'd want to talk about that uh, a little bit more detail further down the road. But there is quite a, a considerable amount of evidence in humans that inflammation uh, can cause uh, depressive symptoms. And by the way, there's a, an, a ton of evidence in animals uh, for a similar kind of relationship, of course, with animal research, it's always possible to say, well, you know, is the animal really experiencing the same as a human would experience uh, as as part of a depression? And, you know, we, animals can't tell us that they're feeling gloomy about the future or critical about what they might have done in the past. Um, but you can certainly see a lot of behavioral changes in animals that have been uh, inflamed. Um, social withdrawal, for example, loss of the normal capacity for pleasure, changes in energy, sleep-wake cycle, and so on. It looks a lot like depression, and it, it can be very reliably triggered by inflammation in animals. So I think there's grounds to think that inflammation could be causal in at least some people with depression. And this gets back to the one-size-fits-all thing that we were talking about earlier. I'm not imagining, and I don't think anybody really is uh, in the field is imagining, that inflammation is a complete explanation for the whole of depression. But uh, for a significant group of people with 
a psychiatric diagnosis of major depressive disorder, it could be relevant. And for another important uh, constituency of patients who have so-called comorbid depression arising in the context of, of uh, uh, medical inflammatory disorders, that there could be the same causal relationship between inflammation and um, uh, mood uh, states in those individuals. So if you assume that there is uh, a causal connection or can be between inflammation and depression, um, then you would anticipate that uh, a drug or any other kind of intervention that reduced inflammation would have antidepressant benefits. But uh, you also would want to know um, that the patient who was depressed uh, had evidence of inflammation before you offered them some kind of novel treatment with an anti-inflammatory drug. Again, this is not about finding a one-size-fits-all solution, a panacea. It's about a more targeted approach. So that gets to biomarkers. You know, what are the blood tests? What are the investigations that a practitioner could run um, in real life, imaginably, that would uh, help us decide whether or not somebody who came to see their doctor because they were depressed was also inflamed and therefore might benefit from a, an anti-inflammatory approach to treatment. And there are a huge number of uh, potential biomarkers available to us. Uh, I mean, one of the, um, the sort of under sort of subtext to this whole book is that uh, the last 15, 20 years have seen uh, astonishing uh, developments in immunology, in the science of the immune system. We now understand a lot more about the immune system than we did. Uh, you know, for example, you mentioned that I, I did medical training at the University of Hong Kong. I did, the, I did the examination for the Royal College of Physicians at the end of the 1980s. So I, I learned clinical immunology to that level. And when I compare what I was taught at the end of the 1980s with what is now understood about how the immune system works, I'm really amazed by how much more deeply we understand that whole system and how much more measurable it's become. So, you know, you can take a blood sample from uh, somebody and uh, measure hundreds or thousands of different cell types, uh, many different kinds of inflammatory proteins in circulation. Uh, you can measure gene expression uh, and epigenetic marking of many different cell types. You can take the cells out of the body and you can stimulate them under various conditions in the lab, see how they actually function uh, as part of uh, a response to uh, inflammatory challenge and so on. I mean, there are a huge range of new diagnostic tools uh, that have been uh, created by the growth of immunology. And what we need to do, and I think this is where the field is at at the moment, is work out, well, which, if any, of those uh, things that we can easily measure in a blood test uh, as a marker of the inflammatory state of, of, of the immune system are going to be most relevant to understanding depression and, predict, and, and, and predicting the response to uh, anti-inflammatory in, interventions. Um, so you mentioned CRP, you mentioned cytokines. Those are proteins that we can measure in the blood. Um, and they've been the kind of workhorse of a lot of the uh, research that's been done in this area so far but they're by no means the only things that we can measure um, and I think it'll be very interesting to see over the next few years as the field moves forward can we come up with even better uh, biomarkers measures uh, blood things that we can measure in a simple blood sample that we can use to diagnose low levels of inflammation that may nevertheless be causally related to depression. And then we could say, well, you know, uh, we could imagine a future where a patient comes to the clinic, they're depressed, uh, they have a blood test, it shows they're also inflamed, and that points them in the direction of an anti-inflammatory intervention rather than, for example, a more conventional serotonin-boosting drug. So um, a, a, a portion of the book is dedicated to this issue of the finding of biomarkers that indicate inflammation um, is, is occurring in the body and then following, following those people up who have raised biomarkers of inflammation and finding startling enough many years later or in the future that they, they are more prone to develop 
psychiatric disorders like depression. Mm. But but I thought the really the, the study that really impressed me most of all, um, that that did most to convince me of your story, was the one about the vaccination of healthy young people who had an fMRI scan mm -hmm. done, um, whereby post vaccination. Um, there were brain changes in terms of brain activities in a particular part of the brain, the cingulate, in response to them looking at faces. Because mm -hmm. that merged a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. It merged, first of all, the brain story. It brought inflammation into the brain. There was something mm -hmm. happening now in the brain. Because another point your book makes is that psychiatrists have, have viewed the blood-brain barrier as meaning mm -hmm. they don't have to bother too much about inflammation. Inflammation mm -hmm. something that happens outside the brain, not in the brain. And, mm -hmm. and so that's an important bit. But the other thing that I liked about this study was it helped us understand, in a sense, more practically why people might get depressed. Because we know there's something about the way they react to the world that is part of that story. So th that study seemed to bring everything together. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, I do like that study. And I mean, I've... I've... You, I've sort of cited it many times. I should say it's it's a study by Neil Harrison, where he was the senior investigator on it, uh, who is a you know a, a UK psychiatrist and clinical scientist. Uh, he did that in Brighton. I think he's just moving to Cardiff. So this is um, a, a great uh, example of um, how you can use imaging to try and um, unravel a little bit the uh, explanatory path that links uh, inflammation in the body to a change in mood and basically what he, you've kind of summarized it already but basically what he did was he found a group of healthy young people and he put them in the scanner twice and the first time he put them in the scanner he showed them you know emotional faces sad faces and we know from a, a lot of work that's been done previously in in, in imaging research that if you show people uh, sad faces, to put it simply, you tend to activate the regions of the brain that are normally important in um, uh, in creating sad emotional states. If you show people fearful faces, you tend to activate the regions of the brain that are important in generating fear. Um, so and that was all known before Neil did this experiment. Then he put the uh, young people in uh, with placebo. He showed that, sure enough, when they looked at the faces, it activated bits of the brain, like the amygdala, like the cingulate uh, cortex, that we know are important in emotional uh, function and emotional control. And then they were scanned again after a typhoid vaccination. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, typhoid vaccination, vaccination generally, is designed to stimulate an immune reaction. It's designed to stimulate, uh, in the short term, an inflammatory response. And that's what these people experienced. Um, they had increased levels of um, cytokines in circulation. They had increased levels of depressive symptoms or dysphoric symptoms. And when they were scanned, there was uh, a change in the way that their brain responded to these emotional faces, uh, which was correlated with uh, the extent to which they felt depressed following the vaccination. and. So you're right, it does very satisfyingly join some dots. So it joins the dots between what's happening in the in the blood in terms of uh, cytokines, uh, what's happening in the brain in terms of amygdala and cingulate function, and what's happening in the mind in terms of depressive or dysphoric symptoms. And uh, as you also remarked, it's an experiment that... Um, uh, not that long ago, would have been regarded as completely bonkers. Uh, you know, why would you why would you imagine that inducing uh, an inflammatory reaction in the body would have any effect on brain function? Because certainly, when I was at medical school, which was you know in the mid nineteen eighties, I can remember being taught as a matter of fact that the brain was immune privileged, that it was segregated from the uh, circulation. Uh, the bloodstream by the blood-brain barrier, and the blood-brain barrier was conceived as something like I talk about it in the book as a Berlin Wall in the brain. It was a very, um, it, it was a very sort of rigid partition, uh, supposedly between the blood and the brain, and therefore, you know, the idea that uh, large proteins like cytokines or other inflammatory proteins or cells that were 
released into the body as a result of vaccination could get across that Berlin Wall and into the brain. Well, that you know, in the 1980s, that was impossible uh, because you know that was that was the dogma, that was the understanding at the time. Now, the uh, fMRI experiment uh, is one piece of evidence, and there's a lot of other evidence um, actually out there to say that that the Berlin Wall in the brain just doesn't exist as such. There is a blood-brain barrier. It's not like there's completely free uh, passage of cells and proteins between the blood and the brain, uh, but it's a much more permeable interface uh, than than we had imagined. And in fact, there are many channels of communication between the blood and the brain. Uh, and and the experiment that we've been talking about illustrates that yes, indeed, those exist. And somehow, the inflammatory reaction to a vaccination is sending a signal into the brain, which is changing how the brain works. Well, I, I'm aware that we've taken up a lot of your time. We're running out of time. I, I want to be very quick now. But um, uh, there's another pathway into the brain. You, you, you describe very lucidly in the book different methods by which this blood-brain barrier might be breached or may not be exist in the way it was. But I thought another very interesting bit was the vagus nerve. Mm. The vagus nerve as being another way in. And I particularly like the anecdotes about the oracle. I mean, could you explain <laughs> what the oracle is mm. and how massaging it mm. might uh, help you if you were suffering from dyspepsia? Mm. Well, so the, I think the Vegas story is very interesting. I think, um, you know, uh, the people will know that the Vegas nerve is comes out of the brain and it it has a very, very sort of extensive innovation throughout the body. There's hardly an organ in the body that isn't innovated by the Vegas nerve. And it generally acts as part of the parasympathetic system to basically oppose the fight or flight reaction of the sympathetic nervous system. So it's a calming, you can think of it as a kind of calming influence on the body, generally speaking. Now, uh, although it's very important in innovating the internal organs, it, the vagus doesn't innovate uh, very much of the surface of the body at all. In fact, there's only one patch of skin that is innovated by the vagus, and that is uh, the skin over the oracle. And the oracle is the sort of weird little sort of collagenous protuberance that each of us has in our ears, just above the uh, the opening of the uh, auditory canal, the external auditory meatus, just above that is a little cartilaginous bump, that's the oracle. And that area is innervated by the vagus. And, you know, for many years, uh, people have known or claimed that you can have health benefits by stimulating the oracle. Um, in the book, I talk about the alderman's itch, which is uh, the story I was taught at medical school again, about how, um, uh, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, people that were uh, feasting on great banquets uh, in the Lord Mayor's company uh, in the City of London. Remember, I was trained at Barts in the City of London, so we were very focused on that sort of uh, quaint story. Uh, people feasting on these great banquets would occasionally struggle with indigestion and they'd relieve their indigestion by massaging uh, the oracle, which stimulated the vagus we now know and stimulated the vagal uh, control over the stomach and other parts of the intestinal system. So that's the alderman's itch story. That's where the oracle comes from. It's one of the, it's the only bit of the surface of the body that's directly innervated by the vagus and therefore it's the only easy way to stimulate, uh, or has been historically the only easy way, but there are in fact now a number of other ways you can stimulate the vagus. There are electrical devices that you can put uh, directly onto the vagus nerve as it travels down the neck, and uh, these are implantable devices. They're not. It's not a trivial procedure to uh, uh, implant them, but uh, in the States, uh, vagal nerve stimulators have been licensed for depression for quite some time. Um, it, it's debatable how they work, but in the book I summarise some of the evidence, which I think is very exciting, to show that one of the things the vagus does, in addition to kind of calming the gut and slowing the heart rate, it reduces levels of inflammation. Uh, so it's conceivable, although not yet proven, that uh, vagal nerve stimulation uh, works as an antidepressant, perhaps because it reduces uh, levels of inflammation in the body. Uh, but I think that's all still to be explored and further developed. I think the other point 
that I'd draw from that story is that um, you know people may be listening to this and thinking, well, I'm quite interested in how inflammation and and uh, and depression and other mental states might be related, but I'm really not that. It's not I'm not that interested in drugs or drug development. Uh, I think it's important to realize that the basic science of how the immune system and the nervous system interact interact. Uh, I think it's really. I think it's going to be relevant for drug development, but it's not exclusively relevant to drug development. I think it could be relevant to thinking about, uh, you know, new approaches to vagal stimulation. Uh, I'm intrigued by some of the preliminary evidence that's beginning to appear in the literature that techniques like meditation, for example, uh, mindfulness, psychological approaches to uh, uh, controlling stress uh, and the response to stress. Uh, these also seem to have uh, anti-inflammatory uh, benefits. So uh, I think the Vegas story is interesting in its own right, but I think it also reminds us that there are potentially many ways of uh, controlling uh, inflammation. It's not all just about drugs, but if we can get better biomarkers to identify which patients are most likely to benefit from anti-inflammatory interventions, uh, there could be a range of different op- options open to them therapeutically in future, I hope. So one final question. Your book um, ends with this intriguing question about whether there'll be new drugs and these drugs will be anti-inflammatory drugs Mm. and that they will treat depression. You mentioned anti-inflammatory drugs being um, pioneered in the treatment of dementia, Mm. um, but it seemed that there was a bit of a gap there. I I, I wanted to get some sense from you of whether you think uh, we're going to see these drugs uh, in in the pharmacies in the next year or, or the next mm-hmm. ten years, or or what's happening on that front? Because the the point of the book, in a way, is to say there's new hope, mm-hmm. um, it, because there's a new way of thinking about depression. Mm-hmm. But the the bit where we see that new hope delivered. Um, w- um, was kind of like the, the book ended a l- little bit like a cliffhanger at that mm-hmm. point of mm-hmm. what happens next. Mm-hmm. Well, so what happens next is very. Uh, important question obviously i mean uh and i suppose I, I would say one thing straight away which is that um i think the you know everything that we've been talking about really uh the you know the relationship between the body and the mind with the immune system as a kind of crucial channel of communication between two things i think is somewhat disruptive in the current um way of thinking about how medical services are organized, how medical professionals are trained. You know, we live in a very um, dualist world in Western medicine, a very split world. In the book, I call it medical apartheid, which I think is quite a strong phrase, but I think is just about justifiable. You know, we've got mental and physical health services uh, separated. uh, And I think that's very often to the detriment of uh, both patients with a primary diagnosis of physical disease and patients with a primary diagnosis of mental disease. In the book, I highlighted one of the, I, what I think is one of the most shocking healthcare statistics um, out there at the moment, which is that patients with a, a diagnosis of serious mental illness, that's schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depressive disorder, in the UK in 2018, have life expectancy reduced by 12 to 15 years compared to um, what you would expect in, in patients or, or people without those uh, serious mental illnesses. So that's telling us that there are a lot of people who's, who are mainly seeing psychiatrists or psychologists or mental health professionals because their primary diagnosis is psychiatric, are having uh, severely reduced life expectancy, presumably because of underdiagnosed, undertreated physical disease. Uh, that's just one example of how I think this split between mental and physical uh, health care provision is disadvantageous to many patients. And one thing that I think we could think about sort of immediately is how do we, could we reorganize services? Could we reorganize training? Could we rethink how uh, patients are, are, you know, if you will, processed by the medical profession, processed by the National Health Service, so that they are offered a more joined up assessment of both physical and mental uh, uh, healthcare uh, problems that they might have. I think that would, I think that's doable immediately, um, and I think it would be welcomed by many patients. And I think that's one immediate uh, change that I would hope the book plays some small part in stimulating. In relation to actual new treatments, new drugs, you know, there's actually already quite a lot of evidence that anti-inflammatory drugs have uh, 
beneficial effects on depression. Um, <clears throat> there have been several uh, uh, studies that have shown solid evidence for that, but they've been, um, the evidence we have so far has come sort of, uh, again, somewhat accidentally. It's come from studies of anti-inflammatory drugs for disorders like arthritis, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, in other words, medical inflammatory disorders. Uh, those patients have often had, you know, a simple questionnaire administered to see what effect uh, on well-being or mood has been uh, uh, has, has occurred during the course of treatment. If you look at those data, you can see that there's pretty robust effects of anti-inflammatory drugs on mood. It tends to make people feel better and more cheerful. Um, but because the trials weren't designed primarily to test that hypothesis, they were designed primarily to show whether the drugs had benefits on the physical symptoms of disease, I would regard that evidence, although uh, highly supportive, as, as not yet quite a slam dunk. It's a, it's a sort of circumstantially supportive um, uh, body of evidence. What I think we need to do is run trials that are designed specifically to test the hypothesis that in at least some patients with depression, uh, an anti-inflammatory drug can have antidepressant benefits. And those trials are ongoing, um, uh, not yet in vast number, but I mean, we are about to uh, start such a trial uh, in Cambridge, Oxford, London, and elsewhere in the UK as part of a Wellcome Trust funded consortium with, with Janssen and, uh, and other companies. Uh, we'll be starting that trial this year, and that's looking at an anti-inflammatory drug as an adjunctive treatment for uh, depressive symptoms in people who have uh, major depressive disorder and uh, are, are remaining uh, severely symptomatic despite uh, conventional treatment. So I think the, those trials are beginning to happen, and obviously, you know, we don't know what the results of them will be. But it, it'll, it, you know, I would think it's in the order of, uh, um, you know, five to ten years. I would think for new treatments to get onto the market. Uh, I'm a bit more optimistic about the possibility that you could see new anti-inflammatory drugs for comorbid depression in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory disorders. I can imagine that happening within a few years um, for uh, new anti-inflammatory drugs for major depressive disorder. I think it'll be a bit longer. And of course, everything takes longer than you could possibly believe it would do at the outset. So I, 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 think, it's, I think it's reasonable for people to sort of set their clocks to a sort of uh, that sort of two to ten year horizon for new treatments coming forward, but I, I think, as I said at the start, that the implications of a new uh, of the new science linking body to mind, I think that has practical implications for how we think about professional training and, and service delivery that we could begin to uh, act on immediately. Professor Edward Bulmore, thank you very much indeed. The book is called The Inflamed Mind, A Radical New Approach to Depression, and it's published by Short Books. Professor Ed Bulmore, thank you. Thanks very much.